Cecilia Stanton Adams, CEO of Stanton Adams Consulting. Really excited to be here today, surrounded by all of you that are just as passionate of, about diversity as I am. Um, I'm very humbled to be here at the 21st Annual Multicultural Marketing Conference. Um, I've known Rick over 10 years, and he has been instrumental in, in really making some, some groundwork here in, in the Twin Cities. Um, I was also really excited to see Elsa here, who was my mentor at Metro State, uh, and of course, my wife, who partners with me um, on our business. So today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the ultimate partnership. And I'm going to promise you, it's, it's not going to be very complicated, but it's going to take your diversity initiative to the next level. So I've been working in diversity and inclusion for over 15 years. I don't want to date myself. And so, you know, I, I really started early on when, when diversity wasn't even, um, you know, a field, right? And so I'm really glad that I really kept that focus and passion on diversity because ultimately now I have a whole career path um, to follow. So um, just so that you know a little bit about myself, um, I, my, I have my bachelor's degree in psychology, my master's in sociology, and a master's in industrial psychology. This was the path I had to take because there was no major in diversity. Um, but it really helped me to understand how people develop their sense of self. But this is not really what's most important about me. What's really most important about me is that both of my parents were um, born in Honduras, Central America. It's really a surprise to a lot of people when I tell them that because people are always like, well, aren't you African American? And I'm like, no, I'm from Honduras. And people in, in my own community, Latinos, will say, no, 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 no. And then by, uh, always, the second question is, well, is your mother or your father from Honduras? Well, both of them are. I am full Honduranian, which to that, you know, people really don't understand that because when they think of Honduranians, they think of people like this. And so they have to give me the next test. They have to say, well, do you speak Spanish? And of course, when I was growing up, I didn't learn Spanish, but I always have my pat answer. No entiendo mucho, pero um, uh, puedo hablar un poquito, right? And so it's, it's enough to get by, and they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, but where's your parents from exactly in Honduras? <laughs> Right, so I have to tell them about Puerto Cortes and Tegucigalpa, Rotan, and finally people start to get it. And the thing that really frustrates me is that we do this for every uh, individual identity. We kind of block people into looking one way, whether it's gay or lesbian or somebody with a disability, um, you know, if it's an African American or Africans. We tend to think that people are going to look to you one certain way. But one of the really interesting things is that Honduranians are very diverse. These three young ladies here, from Honduras. These two ladies here, from Honduras. And in 2010, this was Miss Honduras. 2010, can you believe that? And now you can kind of see how I fit into that community, right? Um, I spent a lot of the first part of my life trying to figure out how I fit in within my own community. And that was enough to really push me into this field of diversity. And I've loved it ever since. Today I'm going to do a couple of things, because I, I don't like to really kind of go through the same rote things that we're always talking about. I like to shake it up a little bit. So today I'm hoping to inspire you to some new thinking about diversity. I also want to challenge you to build the ultimate partnership, and we'll talk about what that means. And then I want you to think about how you're gonna translate your ideas into actions, because ultimately, that's all that matters. What's gonna live on after today? So let me take you back to 15, 16 years ago when I first got my um, job in diversity. And you know, I was lucky enough to be in a lot of different companies where um, I was the very first diversity director or diversity manager. And really, they didn't know what to do with me. So a lot of times, you know, I felt like that, that woman on an island to myself. They had me sitting in HR because this is kind of people related, right? But my budget was sitting in, in marketing because it's multicultural marketing of some sorts, right? Um, so again, I found myself not really knowing where I fit in. But I had this wonderful passion for diversity and I knew that diversity was going to be instrumental for making organizations successful. So I knew one of the things that I was going to have to do if I was gonna be a success 
was I was gonna have to learn how to build a bridge, right? I had to build a bridge to other people, to other departments, and help them understand the passion that I saw, the vision that I saw. But I went around and I started talking to all the people in accounting and finance and actuarial and all those great departments that you're hoping you're gonna jump for joy when you tell them about diversity, and they don't really care, right? They said, mm, go back and you know prepare. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to prepare? And they were like, well, build the business case, AKA, show me the money. So it meant that I had to go back and really develop an argument for why this was important to the bottom line of the organization. It wasn't enough to say that I was a passionate about diversity and that it was the right thing to do, but I really had to prove that it was actually going to help build the organization in term, terms of a return on investment. So I set out to work to do that, and it wasn't easy. It was a lot of research that had to go behind it, especially in the early years when we really didn't understand all of the things that go into the business case that we talk about today. Um, I also had to really think about something that was very complicated and make it very simple. Because after all, if I was going to influence people from different departments, I had to make sure that they got it right away in their own language. So the business case is all about identifying the problem, right? So the problem, you know, that I found were, you know, there were three particular um, areas that I think will resonate with all of you when you think about your own organization. The first problem was the United States is becoming increasingly diverse in every single way. So not only do we see the ethnic diversity is growing, right? 80% um, of the total workforce growth over the next few years is going to be Latinos. Right? So if, if, um, if you think about hiring anybody, you're going to have to really understand the Latino community and population. We also have for the first time five generations working side by side in the workplace. 10, 20 years ago, if you were 65 years old, you would retire and you would move on to a life, you know, cruising or on the golf course. But technology has made it in health so that people are living longer and they're able to give back in their careers a lot longer. A lot of people also lost a lot of money during the recession, so they can't retire even if they wanted to. So you have people in their 70s and 80s working alongside people in, the, in their um, 20s or 18, 19 years old. You think that's not going to be a problem. That can be a problem. Um, you also have people from multiple different religions, um, people with disabilities. I was actually talking with a young woman the other day who works for an organization called Autism Works. And um, what they do is they help people with autism find jobs in the workplace. You know, so think about all of that diversity that's happening in the workplace. And is, are, are our organizations prepared for that? Well, I knew that my organization was not prepared for that. The second problem was the talent shortage. So, you know, eventually a lot of the people who will eventually move out into other careers or out into retirement are going to leave this huge gap in the workforce with people that are unprepared to take on those roles, whether they were millennials or Gen Xers, even adding them together, there aren't going to be enough to fill those roles. So we have to look for that talent everywhere that it sits, and we have to make sure that that talent is educated in the right things, that they have the skill sets to be able to fill that need. The last one is the one that you know is often um, hard to articulate, but it's really important to every organization. That's creativity and innovation. And if you want any of that, you're going to have to have diversity at the table. And there's enough research studies that have been um, put out by Harvard Business Reviews and others that really attest to the fact that when you have diversity and you understand how to leverage and management, manage it, you're actually going to get a greater result in terms of your products and services. So if that's the problem, I had to come up with a solution, right? So they're like, all right, we get you, we know, this is important. What do we do, Cecilia? We hired you for this. And I'm like, well, it's really easy. Change the way you see the world. Okay, not that easy, right? Um, because first you have to realize that other people see the world differently. And that's where we really had to start because a lot of times people take for granted that whatever I see, everyone else sees. And so it was really helping to retrain people to be aware of the fact that your perception is simply your own perception. It's based on your own individual beliefs and values and traditions. It's everything that comes from your upbringing. And someone else might have completely different cultural values than you. And so you really have to start seeing the world in a different way. 
you also have to, tu have to turn those different perceptions at your organizational culture. When you look around and you see everyone um, that looks just like you, you have to really wonder, are you really creating an environment where people from other backgrounds are really going to feel comfortable? Are they going to feel like this is their home as well? And if you, are, if you think that it is, then you know, that's a challenge. you got to go back to changing your view because it's not going to feel like home to everyone else. So how do you change that culture? And then understanding the culture of your consumers. So, you know, just like the employees are changing, so are the consumers that are buying your products and getting your services. And a lot of times those needs are going to be very, very different. When I work for a financial services company, they learn the hard way that when you're advertising to people of different cultures, you know, they think very differently about money. Um, a lot of people, you know, don't believe in um, credit cards or interest bearing accounts. Um, things that you wouldn't even think about unless you really got into the cultures and understood it. They even learned that certain colors were seen as inappropriate to talk about happy things or financial wealth. Um, and again, learning that the hard way. And so once you know the solution, it should be real easy from there. You just do it, right? Um, well, you have to really think about what happens when you don't because people don't always just do it. Instead, they kind of sit around and wait. And ultimately, three things happen. One, you have high turnover, unhappy employees. Data shows that a third of your employees are disengaged. That means they're costing more money to your organization um, than, than they're actually bringing in. Uh, unhappy employees, they feel like they're not able to add value to the organization because they don't know where your organization is going and they don't feel like you really care about who they are as an employee. Revenues are starting to plummet because they're really not getting it right in terms of being able to reach that market that is growing and changing. And the last thing that we really don't want, and we hear this all the time on Love & Hip Hop, you don't want to be irrelevant because as soon as you become irrelevant, nobody even speaks your name and you're pretty much done as an organization. So, okay, we've got people on board. People are listening, they're like, what do we do next? Let's get involved in some strategic planning some um, visioning, some mission, right, some goals. And a lot of you started to do that within your organizations. Each of your departments went your separate ways and started developing all of these wonderful things. And what happened? Everybody ran in different directions. And so what you see is that people are spending a lot of time on their diversity initiatives, but they're not aligned. They don't know what, what the other department is doing, and so there's a mismatch, and they're not getting their biggest bang for their buck. They're not leveraging each other. And when that happens, it also impacts our customers. We tell our customers that we believe in diversity and inclusion, and yet they don't experience that when they come in to get products or services. So our customers end up being frustrated and confused and not sure of what you're really talking about. I mean, we all know what happens when we're not aligned. We've seen it time and time again, right? So what do we do about that? You know, our diversity initiatives can sometimes look like this. You know, we've got a lot of really strong things happening in different components of our organization, but it's really put together by a very thin thread. And anything could come along and break that apart like the recession. And in fact, in the um, early 2000s, we saw just that. A lot of people just got rid of all of their um, diversity budget because they had to figure out what to do with the little budget that they had. And they couldn't afford diversity anymore. So all of the work that they had done made them actu actually had to turn around and go back to ground zero. So hopefully I've made the case for you that you know this is something that we're struggling with. So what's the answer? The ultimate partnership is the answer. A lot of times we're still that lone person on an island, but maybe we're a department of one that's really moving forward and trying to make things happen. But until we start partnering with those organizations uh, or those departments within our organization, we're not going to be successful. Here's where a great partnership can happen. HR and marketing. And I know that doesn't sound extremely positive. I mean, HR and marketing is not always the greatest together, but imagine if marketing and HR were aligned on every brand promise and every marketing message. Imagine what could happen, right? But what happens right now is you have this push and pull. 
In fact, a Fast Company just recently wrote an article about why we hate HR because they're always stifling our creativity and coming up with compliance, right? They're always holding us back and not letting us change things that we think need to be changed. And of course, people complain about marketing because after all, all they're doing up there is having fun making paper airplanes, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of the things that both of these departments can do to bring us forward. Number one, when you think about marketing, they are extremely good at technology. They were at the cutting edge when social media came out, right? So they mastered social media like no other. Um, I was working with an organization where um, they were rebuilding the website, and um, HR really wanted to have a robust website so that we could really recruit a lot of diversity. So they wanted to have their diversity mission up, pictures, and all this material. And we showed up, and the marketing department was running it, and marketing was like, no. We don't do that anymore. We utilize social media to really sell the story of the brand and the organization. And that was a learning for HR. They basically brought HR into the 21st century. Marketing is also really good at creativity. I mean, just think about all the guerrilla marketing ads that, that used to happen that really caught your eye and got you going. They also have what we need the most, the connection to the customer. We can't forget the customer. They're the most important, and marketing has their attention. HR, let's not forget HR. They are consistent. They understand compliance. They know alignment. I mean, my time in HR, it's taught me nothing else but internal communications channel, right? How to take information and cascade it up and down an org chart. They can do it like nobody's business. And they have the second best connection. They're connected to all the employees. Imagine, right? So let's put these two, two folks together. There's a couple reasons why they don't often work out. So I'm gonna give you some recommendations on how to do this. And if you're not in HR or marketing, if you're in a different department, think about another department that you could partner with because these same recommendations are gonna hold true. One, develop respect for the other's expertise. Yes, when you're in finance, you may not have appreciation for marketing. If you're in actuarial sciences, you may not understand financing. Get to know them, right? And not, not only get to know them over coffee and understand their personality, but understand the work that they do. Spend a day in the life in their department and understand what's important to them, what are their priorities, and how are they getting diversity work done. Second, meet to exchange ideas and synergies. There's nothing like putting a challenge in the table in front of diverse groups of people with diverse thought. They're gonna come up with so many great ideas that you never could have as one loan department. Assess what needs to be done collectively and individually. Don't just meet and then go away and meet a year later. Really break down your goals and then hold each other accountable to those different goals. And then number four, celebrate your success for brand alignment. Again, if everything that you're telling your customers, you're also living and breathing with your employees, it's gonna be awesome. Xerox did it when they wanted to come out as the, um, the solutions leader for documents. They had to change their brand completely. And so they, they relied on the marketing department to go out to their employees and, help the, and allow the employees to help build that brand message. When the brand message went out, the employees lived and breathed it. So it was in alignment. We also saw the same thing with Goldman Sachs. They really wanted to build a whole um, you know, organization of customer service. So marketing worked very closely with HR to make sure every single orientation that a new employee was going through taught them the cultural values that were gonna be important to reaching the customer. So when that customer came in, they lived and breathed everything that they saw in, in that marketing message. So those are the great things that can happen when we align our departments. And at the very end, marketing, you can have your party, but remember, HR is gonna be watching. <laughs> so we don't have to actually say, what if? Because you can actually go back and do. So I hope you go do, and keep up with me online. Cecilia Stanton, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Well, you know, um, you know Cecilia, and, and I wish we had time for a Q&A, but we're gonna, we're just forming our relationship, by the way, Aguilar Productions, along with the Stanton Adams Institute, we're, we're connecting. This is, this is new messaging that uh, corporate America hasn't, 
as I'm learning that, and we're going to do some other real adventures. And thank another hand for Cecilia. It's amazing, amazing work, amazing message. Oh.